Yana and I thought we'll bring you all to Broomfield Church. This is St. Mary and St. Leonard's Church in the parish of Broomfield, Essex. And I have to admit, it's actually one of my favourite churches in the county. Not only because it's stunning, but Yana and I have family connections here, dating back to 1712. So we're going to take a little wander around the church and we're going to tell you a little bit about the history, a few of the parish stories and a little bit about our family history and our connections to this beautiful place. So hope you enjoy the episode. Here we go. The parish church of St Mary the Virgin anciently known as St Leonard, stands prominent in the centre of the village of Broomfield near Chelmsford, Essex. When the original Norman church was built in the late 11th century, possibly around the time of Domesday Book of 1086, the village was known as Brumfelder, Brumfeld, or Brunfell, respectively. The church was probably built on the site of an old wooden Saxon church which existed before the conquest. Before the Normans invaded, Brumfield was owned by a Saxon lord named Sarewulf. His name appears as Lord of 30 other holdings before 1066 around England and as far away as Cornwall. He lost his Broomfield holding after the Normans invaded, but may not have fallen entirely from favour, as his name still appears as landowner of seven places from 1086 onwards. These land holdings were held directly from the crown and so he was answerable to King William I. In telling the history of the church as we know today, I am going to begin its humble beginnings from 1086. From 1086 onwards, the land was owned by Geoffrey de Mandeville, who was also tenant-in-chief of 138 places across the country, which of course included Broomfield and Great Lees, which is interesting as both of these churches have a round tower. Geoffrey was an important doomsday tenant-in-chief and one of the ten richest men in England at the time. William granted him large estates for his loyalty at Hastings. These were primarily in Essex but across ten other counties as well. He served as the Sheriff of London and Middlesex and probably the first Sheriff of Essex too. He was a constable of the Tower of London and one of his castles and possibly his main residence was Pleshy Castle not far from Broomfield. In 1086 Broomfield may only have been a small holding consisting of nine villagers four slaves, 14 acres of meadow, 50 pigs, woodland and a mill situated on the nearby River Chelmer. But it played a small and important part in the history of Norman England, namely due to the Mandeville family. Geoffrey was married twice, firstly to Athelay de Baltz, whom they had issue three children 
and a later second wife, only known to us as Leshalina. His three children are as follows. William, the eldest son, would later become the first Earl of Essex. Beatrice, his daughter, was married to Geoffrey Fitz Eustace, a brother to Godfrey of Beaulieu, the first ruler of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, and Baldwin I, King of Jerusalem. Geoffrey Fitz Eustace, stepmother, was Goda, Princess of Wessex, a daughter of Ethelred the Unready. So then we come to Geoffrey de Mandeville's youngest son, Walter, who was Lord of Broomfield under his father, so paid taxes directly to him. His name is recorded in the Doomsday Book for another 159 places across England. This Walter resided at Broomfield Hall nearly 1,000 years ago and he may have overseen the building of Broomfield Parish Church. The south wall of that original small church containing nave and chancel still survives today. The windows were small lancets then and the chancel was shorter. This can be seen from the line of red Roman bricks that formed the original southeast corner. The church was built from reused material or locally sourced stone. Flint provides one of the biggest sources of material used in the building work. Flint can be found in abundance in Essex and throughout Northwest Europe. In fact, almost every pebble on the beach and in gardens is flint. It's a hard rock found in chalk, a soft white limestone layer that is up to 200 meters thick in North Essex and Cambridgeshire. In Northwest Essex, this chalk is between 66 and 90 million years old. Chalk started as a thick mud on the floor of a prehistoric tropical sea that covered most of Britain and Northwest Europe. This mud contained the remains of tiny sea creatures, plankton, which grew shells of calcium carbonate. When they died, this plankton and their shells fell to the sea floor to form a thick mud, which compacted into chalk over millions of years. As it compacted, it squeezed out the seawater containing dissolved quartz or silica, which comes from the skeletons of tiny sponges, a very simple animal. This silica was pushed out into gaps, cracks and burrows in the chalky mud to form nodules or layers of flint. So it's interesting as we look at the church just in front of us. Most of what we see it's just one huge fossil. The Roman bricks seen in the south wall were probably recycled from an abandoned Roman villa located nearby in New Barn Lane. Just here, where these Roman red bricks are, you can actually see where the old chancel ended. So this part of the church here is the original, that's how big the church was. And it was originally built. And this 
bit at the bottom was the extension. Here on the south side of the church is also a projecting pudding stone. Some believe that such marker stones are an indication of a pre-Christian site. The Roman tiles are also a reminder of an old Essex folk story relating to a dragon. The Mandeville family originally planned to build the church at the top of New Barn Lane, but the dragon of Broomfield would not let them. Each day the villagers and builders, most likely Saxon slaves, set their building materials down at the top of New Barn Lane but each night whilst the villagers slept the sneaky dragon moved those stones down to the green. This continued night after night after night. Finally the villagers gave up and so not to anger the dragon they built the church where it is today. At the end of New Barn Lane, in an adjacent field, is a spot called Dragon's Foot. This is also recorded on the Tyfe maps. Just here is a depression in the ground, now somewhat ploughed out, but still deep enough to show exactly what it once was, a very big dragon's footprint. Dragon's foot was also the site of a Roman building which still yields numerous hypercoursed tiles and bricks. The dragon's story is a delightful one, although truth is it was probably just hard-working Saxons trundling cart loads of Roman bricks down to the green on the orders of their new Norman masters. Well today is very foggy and quite cold but I've taken a wander up New Barn Lane which is not far from St Mary's Church just to have a little look to see if I can find that field called Dragon's Foot Field. It's supposed to be a shallow depression in in the mud but I've not really had a huge amount of luck finding it and on the same spot it is said that a Roman villa once stood there so I'm just checking out these fields the fields would have been 
ploughed over for the last 1,000 years and it does say it's hard to see but as I was walking up just a moment ago I did notice a few Roman bricks actually in the lane so I'm going to show you those now Right now, just here, not sure if you can see it, but there's these red bricks. There's a red brick just there. And another there. These are definitely old Roman bricks. quite a few along this path there's another one there So those bricks would have been reused from the old Roman villa. Now just here, there's loads. So these Roman bricks are about 2,000 years old. And at one stage, I think there's one just there. How cool is that? I'm actually going to take this brick home and show to Yana because she's at school. And I know she'd love to see this. I'm not too far from Brinkwall Church here. I don't know if you can see the spire through the fog. I'm just looking across this field. This field is full of flints. And just a short moment ago, I found this tiny piece of Roman tile. I think I might have actually found Dragon's Foot Field. This is full of Roman tiles. Loads of them. The whole field is scattered. These tiny pieces of Roman brick and tiling. And just here, I'm not sure if you can see that, but this impression in the mud actually does look like a dragon's foot. The lack of cut stone may also be the reason for the round tower. The thickness of a wall at the tower arch, which is virtually that of the church west wall and the tower wall together, shows that this was added later, possibly about 1130. The circular structure of flint was built against the west wall 
The tower grew at a very slow process and over several years and built of rubble and field stones. Elsewhere, church round towers fell out of fashion and so were gradually replaced as transporting stone became easier and more affordable. But Broomfield is proud to be one of the six that survive in Essex. The other five round tower churches in the county can be found at Bardfield Sailing, Great Lees, Laymarsh, South Ockenden and Pentlow. The one here at Brumfield is by far the biggest. The round tower churches of England are an incredible Saxon and Norman cultural legacy. These fantastic historical structures feature round rather than square towers and were mostly built during the early Norman period. They have their roots in Saxon tradition and are confined to just five counties, with the vast majority of them in Norfolk, 124 intact and eight ruins. This could be due to the smaller stone found in East Anglia being more easily fashioned into round towers, but the enigmatic structures are shrouded in mystery with little known about their origins. The first church was dedicated to St Leonard and around 1150 the church and tithes of Brimfield were given to the prior and canons of Holy Trinity London. The Holy Trinity Priory was also known as Christ Church Aldgate, a priory of Austin canons, black canons due to their black cloaks. Founded around 1108 by Queen Matilda of England, wife of King Henry I near Oldgate in London. This foundation appointed the vicars for Brimfield until the Reformation, when it was dissolved in February 1532 and given back to King Henry VIII. Early in this period, the Norman font of Purbeck stone was given to the church. The arcaded sides and four pillars are typical for the period, but the central support is a latter addition. Solid though it looks, the font has been moved several times, and not only in recent reorderings. During the Civil War, the font was thrown out of a church, along with stained glass and candlesticks, as a sign of popery. The story goes that Cromwell's soldiers used it as a trough to water their horses. Certainly it reappeared in the vicarage stable yard, where it was later recognised and restored to the church. During the 14th and 15th centuries, the church underwent a lot of restoration. Larger windows were introduced in the south wall. The earliest was the low side window near the pulpit. As well as gaining larger windows, the church also had its chancel extended in 1430 and a perpendicular style east window installed. The line of Roman bricks in the south wall marks where the old chancel ended. Other changes included the spire of the round tower with its remarkable internal timber frame. The first south porch was built. Other changes included the spire of the round tower with its remarkable internal timber frame. The first south porch was built and to the right of the south door was a holy water stoop since vandalised by the Commonwealth iron clasts. A holy water font or stoop is a vessel containing holy water which is generally placed near the entrance of a church. It is often placed at the base of a crucifix or religious representation. It is used in the Catholic Church, Anglican churches and some Lutheran churches 
to make the sign of the cross using holy water upon entrance of a church. By 1504, the church had been rededicated to St. Mary. When in 1532 Henry VIII dissolved the Priory and the Holy Trinity, the Priory's possessions were bought by Lord Rich of Lees, who used the Broomfield Tithes to help fund his new school at Felsted. Protestant enthusiasm removed the signs of popery, but with the reintroduction of Catholicism and the Mary Tudor, the church wardens at Broomfield had to buy a mass book, cross and images of the rood screen. Under Elizabeth I, the Act of Uniformity brought the end of the Chantry Chapel and the introduction of parish registers. The first page of the earliest register, now in the record office, is decorated with cadells and swashing and reeds. The register book for the parish of Broomfield in the county of Essex, in which is contained all the baptisms, burials and marriages which could be found from the year of our Lord 1546 until the year 1598 and the 27th day of May. The visitation of 1689 gives a depressing picture of what the church was like after the turbulent years of the Commonwealth. The smashed stoop in the porch is a lasting reminder of the dissenters and the destruction they caused across England. The Church of St Mary with St Leonard has all the hallmarks of a subsumed Christianised site. As at Alphamstone in Essex and Pusey in Wiltshire, it has that unusual stone protruding and prominently visible in its foundations. Across the lane from St Mary with St Leonard's, there is a pond. The pond is fed by a stream and several springs. One of the houses, opposite the church, has a rivulet running under the paving stones in the cellar. It is said that the two sarsen stones in front of the church gate were originally in the stream that runs close to the church. The spring and stream, together with evidence of a Roman villa and the unusual black pudding stone in the church foundations, all indicate that the site may have been sacred and predates both Christianity and Roman occupation. The parish registers of St Mary's have a couple of interesting notes inscribed in its pages. One of these includes a reference to the 1884 Colchester earthquake. The Colchester earthquake, also known as the Great English Earthquake, occurred on the morning of 22nd of April 1884 at 18 minutes past 9 in the morning. It caused considerable damage in Colchester and the surrounding villages in Essex. In terms of overall destruction caused, it is certainly the most destructive earthquake to have hit the United Kingdom in at least the last 400 years since the Dover Straits earthquake of 1580. At 18 minutes past 9, the earthquake struck centred mainly in the villages of Wivenhoe, Aberton, Langenhoe and Peldon, causing the surrounding area to rise and fall violently as the waves spread. It lasted around 20 seconds, measuring 4.6 on the Richter scale. The effects were felt across England, as well as in northern France and Belgium. The earthquake damaged about 1,250 buildings. The second interesting entry belongs to the baptism of an eight-week-old baby. It is recorded as follows. Charity Broomfield, a foundling where father or mother was unknown, was baptised August 6th, being as is supposed about eight weeks old. He being found in the road, 
June 14th. Charity Brimfield was sent to London shortly afterwards. Sadly in 1704 there was no established charity to support homeless children. The Foundling Hospital in London, England wasn't founded until 1739 so it is likely that charity ended up in a large household and taught to serve, clean and attend the masters of that home. Life must have been grim and sad too as Charity died aged 10 and was buried on the 20th of October 1714 in St James Piccadilly Westminster a very affluent area and a big indication he served in a wealthy household. My family connections begin in Broomfield between 1705 and 1712 with the death of William James, saddler of Chelmsford. A record of deeds records Fisher's farm, 40 acres in Broomfield and two messwages in Chelmsford Marketplace, in the occupation of Lionel Sheldon, grocer, and William Jane Sadler. This 40 acres of land were likely taken over by Simon Jane's, as he appears in the village shortly after 1705, and his name is first recorded in the parish register in 1732, with the birth of my sixth great grand aunt, Mary Jane's. She was baptised on the 7th of April 1732 and was the daughter of Simon and Mary James. This birth, however, was not a happy start for the family as Simon's wife Mary died two days later on the 9th of April. A strong indication that death was caused as a result of childbirth complications. A common cause of death for women in the 18th century the year that followed must have been difficult for Simon, but he didn't waste much time and remarried a year later on the 18th of October 1733 to my sixth great grandmother, Sarah Crow, a daughter of William Crow of Boreham. Over the next 10 years, the couple had three children, Simon James Jr baptised on the 10th of November 1734, Jonathan James Janes, baptised on the 27th of May 1739, he is my fifth great-grandfather, and lastly Anne Janes, baptised on the 28th of March 1742. The only information available as to where in Broomfield they resided was through the UK land tax redemption in 1798. Jonathan resided in a property owned by John Parsons. Parson graves can still be found in Broomfield Cemetery today, many on the south side of a church where the eldest burials exist. The Jane's family were residents of the parish until the death of Jonathan James Janes on the 27th of May 1817. He was the last member of the family to reside in Broomfield as later generations took advantage of a newly built canal system in 1790 and relocated to Haybridge, Essex. For more than 100 years the Janes family were a part of the Broomfield community although their legacy and connection to the Chelmsford area is much older than that and can be traced back to 1585 to the patriarch of the family, Abel Janes, forefather to both the Essex England Janes and the illustrious Janes family of Massachusetts. Both families share DNA and descend from the same branch of the family. Here in England, the 17th century Essex Janes are difficult to trace due to civil war and years of hardship under Cromwell. As a result, many gaps exist and lots of names are lost from history. As for our American cousins, many members of his branch of Janes thrived 
they established the Townsville of Janesville, Wisconsin in 1835, whilst other members of her family met their ends tragically. The story of Samuel and Sarah Janes is one of the most remembered. They were murdered alongside three of their children on the 13th of May 1704 in a bloodied attack known as the Perscomac Massacre. Not only murdered, but scalped by Indians and left for dead. The Brookfield Parish Church of St Mary the Virgin with St Leonard and the land it sits on has an incredible history spanning a period that predates the Roman occupation of England. The building itself is built from rock millions of years old and its history ties together antiquity, Roman, Saxon, medieval, Victorian, the New World and folklore. It truly is one of my favourite churches and a crowning gem, a treasure for the people of Broomfield and the city of Chelmsford. <laughs>